we are live welcome all to i focus online episode 378 the 53rd in the oculoplasty module we are back again for the part 2 of professor jeff rose's lecture on techniques in orbitotomy and its complications dr jeff rose he received his education in bsc pharmacology in the year 76 and medical school in 79 He has a fellowship of the Royal College of Surgeons in '85 and Royal College of Ophthalmologists in '88. is a member of the Royal College of Physicians '82. Consultant staff at Moorfields Eye Hospital, and he has also been the director of the Ednexel service and is now an honorary consultant to the hospital. He received the prestigious Lester Jones Anatomy Award from the Esopress. He lectures widely and presented various named lectures. To name. the wendell hughes lecture this year at the american academy the senior research fellow of the biomedical research center at the institute of ophthalmology london he is a past president of the isopress and the british oculoplastic uh, uh, surgery society over to you professor for tonight's lecture this so i'm just getting things organized and nearly there thank you very much for the intro sorry and get rid of this right i trust that you all have the blue screen absolutely um, so i've just uh, i've got an extra one come up on this screen which is annoying sorry just trying to get rid of unnecessary uh, things on my screen and finally get the proper pointer well thank you very much dr subhav for the intro again and uh, carrying on really from our last lecture Uh, I want to go through some of the complications of orbital surgery, but I, I could probably give you about two hours worth of lecture for that. In reality, some of them are my own, some of them from other sources. But uh, let's run through them, try and get some order to them. And again, please note: no unauthorized reproduction of the clinical pictures. You're welcome to take things from diagrams and so on, and X-rays, but pictures are more difficult. So complications for orbital surgery really one is talking about the intraoperative changes that can occur damage to structures during access to the lesion on your way there damage to levator apparatus and fascia extraocular muscles and nerves sensory nerves blood vessels optic nerve or globe and then you get collateral damage during removal of the mass due to having to actually move around the mass that you're trying to remove you will compress neighboring structures and also have a, an effect of things like diathermy on neighboring structures and so you may cause a loss of blood supply to other structures you may get thermal injuries particularly if you use bipolar for any length of time or you may get compression injuries as I'll show you and then one has the sort of post operative changes uh the uh, for example serous exudation vasospasm and blindness and I'll we'll talk quite a bit about that hemorrhage within the orbit with rising pressures infection adhesions fibrosis inclusion cysts effect on the sinuses and central nervous system and other problems within the orbit so i'm trying to get rid of a bar which is hard to get rid of it's in my way annoyingly excuse me a moment I'm trying to get rid of this the menu bar anybody know how to get rid of menu bar or is it just me uh, hide the menu is that on the screen so that's it nope. it's coming smooth yes sir you can continue please sorry it's 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 coming clear clear yes sir uh, yeah, not, not at my end so i can't point to things thank you uh, just just, be... just just click on the screen sir and um, uh, you should be able to okay right so what what is the uh, what you know why why is the orbit particularly at risk and 
the answer is it's a fixed space, largely limited by bone. So this gives a lot of uh, rigidity, allows pressure to build up and so on, and also makes surgical access more difficult, particularly to certain areas like the back of the orbit where one is talking the narrowest of spaces. That narrowest of spaces, the orbital apex, is also the most crowded and has the highest density of important and susceptible structures, such as motor nerves and so on, and arteries. Uh, there are a very large number of fine structures that require a good blood supply in that uh, within the orbit. And there's a poor ability for central nervous system derived structures to recover. For, in other words, the optic nerve has this low ability for CNS derived uh, ne neural recovery. So let's go through the intraoperative complications. The, for example, damage to structures on your way in, levator apparatus and fascia. And with damage to levator apparatus and the anterior fascia, transient ptosis is very common after orbital surgery when you use the upper lid skin crease approach. For example, here, a huge rhabdomyosarcoma. Here's the child a day after excision of it, intact excision of this huge uh, rhabdo you know, it's inevitable that they get a lot of edema because the lid skin is thin and you are causing congestion right up to the apex of the orbit where the natural drainage of fluid occurs. So you get this mechanical ptosis very commonly. Uh, you may get le edema within levator or even hemorrhage within levator if you're having to work on it. Or you may indeed get a neuropraxia. And this is almost universal if you're dealing with lesions jammed in the apex. You will have a neuropraxia of most of the nerves, the third, the fourth, uh, the fifth, and the sixth as they pass through the apex. Persistent ptosis is actually rarer and is by far the commonest cause is an aponeurosis defect. But they may be either mechanical or a denervation problem. And these, you can tell the difference. Most uh, denervation problems are neuropraxias of the upper branch of the third cranial nerve and will recover. Typically between weeks eight and 12, atosis will suddenly recover over a matter of a week or so. You get a marked improvement and that's because of re of the upper branch of the third cranial nerve. So, Resolution of edema, as I say, you can get a, quite a lot of edema. The patient kindly sent these photos and here at a week after surgery through the upper lid skin crease, still a little bit of residual edema at week two, but really completely back to normal by week six after upper orbital exploration. As I mentioned, persistent levator aponeurosis after orbitotomy in many cases will be due to the size of the mass resting for many years on the aponeurosis in a patient already at risk of disinsertion of the, of the aponeurosis, as you can see with the high skin fold, but still persistent uh, degree of ptosis. How can we reduce levator damage? We mentioned this before with the upper lid skin crease approach. Well, obviously one goes in through the skin crease and it's tempting to go down to the level of the tarsal plate and follow it northwards to head into the extraconal space. But you are better off actually lifting the orbicularis in the skin and avoiding damage to the anterior surface of levator and go immediately below levator, uh, sorry, not levator, immediately below the orbicularis muscle, keeping the suborbicularis plane, keeping well anteriorly and heading towards the arcus marginalis and you're less likely to damage the anterior levator apparatus and less likely to get atosis. And once you're there, uh, it's tempting to go straight back towards here. But again, if you're liable to damage the levator apparatus. So deliberately go further peripherally and aim to open the septum rather closer to the arcus marginalis to get into the extraconal space. And that way you'll avoid levator damage. And here, for example, dealing with the cyst of the common sheath. In this case, we did it through a conjunctival surface. This is a huge sheath, as you can see, coming out intact uh, through a transconjunctival route. And the levator is at significant risk because it lies between the levator. It's actually in the common sheath between levator 
and the superior rectus. But here is the child about two and a half weeks after surgery with absolutely no evidence of ptosis. So you can avoid levator damage by thinking about where it runs. How do we avoid tissue damage? One of the things is to try and dissect as much tangentially alongside an orbital mass rather than directly towards it or structure. So keep tangential to levator and so on, and you can get out masses intact with relatively little collateral damage. Moving on to other structures that can be damaged, obviously the extraocular muscles and the sheaths around them and the nerves to the muscles. And so, for example, you may get a partial or a complete cranial nerve palsy after the surgery. And here's a patient after removal of an apex lesion with an upper branch third nerve palsy. You can see larger pupil on that side uh, looking downwards slightly in abduction and no levator function at all. And here's the child after removal of a huge intraconal mass of the, well, sorry, the optic nerve and has a pupillomotor fiber uh, paresis, not surprisingly, because they've had the optic nerve removed. Large masses, particularly where they extend outside the orbit, as in this neurofibroma extending out over the uh, frontalis region, as we resect the mass, we go outside and taking out a huge mass, it's you know, six or seven centimeters. And you can see here an upper branch, a scra uh, seventh cranial nerve palsy with no frown lines. And in retrospect, I probably would have done a fixation of the brow at the same time. Uh, other causes, uh, so bicoronal flap, this patient that was referred, so-called after decompression through a coronal approach, uh, and they'd left the patient not only with a lot of proptosis, so they needed a, really a proper decompression, but also with an upper branch uh, frontalis uh, a paresis a palsy, in fact, complete section. Sensory nerves are also damaged, particularly in the orbital floor area. If you're dealing with a fracture, they may already have hypoesthesia of the cheek. Uh, and this is obviously the one that gives the most sensory loss, including the upper teeth, the incisors. Uh, the commonest cause probably isn't direct damage to the nerve. It's probably loss of the blood supply to the nerve. And one of the prominent vessels, arteries, supplying the infraorbital nerve, which runs from posterolaterally to anteromedially, this is a right-sided orbit, is the perforating branch from the orbit going down medial to the nerve and supplying quite a length of it. As you divide this to access the orbital floor for decompression, you cause an ischemic neuropraxia, which recovers in over 95% of patients, but not everyone. Damage to blood vessels during surgery, Obviously, the orbital vasculature you know about, but the most prominent or most important vessels in the tightest areas are things like the ophthalmic artery. Here it is arching over the optic nerve from laterally to medially uh, in the presence of this small mass jammed in the apex. And of course, the nerve, uh, there's a blood supply to the orbit will be at risk with that vessel so close. In fact, the patient did very well with no problems. Again, with masses more superiorly in the orbit, they may be affect the nerve as uh, the vessel, the artery as it goes over the optic nerve, but also may interfere with things like the superior ophthalmic vein, which is running, of course, across this area from laterally to medially. With this. So when you're resecting these large masses, you may interfere with venous drainage. However, having said that, you can have some really gigantic vascular masses you see it's expanded the orbits, absolutely huge. Somewhere it's right next to the optic nerve and therefore it's significant risk of visual loss. And uh, this girl uh, came from a family full of doctors and lawyers. And I thought crumbs, you know, what a patient to have to operate. And so we took out the mass, uh, uh, obstetric or gynecological consultant uncle wanted to come to surgery. So I said, you're welcome to come. And we were sort of showing him the optic nerve and the nerves to the muscles during surgery as we took this out. But the following day, I thought, oh, what will the vision be like? But in fact, she had 6'6 six, six vision. And here she is about 20 months after taking out this huge mass 
with a perfectly normal no praxia at all. So you can get away with it sometimes. And obviously a friendly anaesthetist who drops the blood pressure, but not too much, is invaluable. Last of all, damage to the optic nerve or globe as you access. Uh, obviously, if you're taking out the nerve, it may be significant, but and you may damage the globe. So if you're doing something like taking out optic nerve or transecting optic nerve, for a, a significant biopsy or a lesion within, you need to warn the patient of the risk of globe ischemia and the fact that they'll get an anesthetic cornea and so on. So that's sort of damage on your way in to access the lesion. And then during the actual removal of a mass, you may get uh, a damage to other structures, either due to loss of blood supply, for reasons that we'll talk a wee bit more about after surgery there, Thermal injury, as I mentioned, if you use long bursts of diathermy, you may get spread of heat, which may cause thermal injury and vasospasm of arteries with a loss of uh, function. And you may get compressional injuries, as I will show. So, for example, this patient who came with an absolutely gigantic nerve, benign nerve sheath tumor, I and mean, it was so crowded in the apex, as you can see, going back to the fissure and into the superior orbital fissure. It was gigantic. He had about 50 millimeters of proptosis and about 11 of hypoglobus on that side. You can just make out the optic nerve. Well, removing the whole of that mass, even piecemeal, there was no way one could get it out intact. He ended up with uh, poor vision, uh, and that almost certainly was due to a mixture of pressure. Uh, pressure ischemia and possibly thermal injury because of diathermy around the apex. Interestingly, we've got a series of patients in whom they develop midriasis during surgery with intraoperative decompression of tissues. Uh, and so, for example, doing a medial decompression to help this patient with sphenoid wing meningioma, the, as we move the tissues aside, we're compressing that part of the orbit and they can develop uh, midriasis during surgery. And here is the patient actually after surgery. And they actually showed super sensitivity to dilute pilocarpine. So it looks as though they get a ciliary ganglion ischemia uh, in the, uh, due to this compression. I've never seen it with thyroid medial decompressions of which uh, we've got something over 800 I've now looked at of purely medial decompressions. The thyroid, we don't get that phenomenon. It seems to be when you've got a bulging medial wall and a very narrow uh, apex. And so maybe in these cases, they are actually better dealt with from the nasal side, as we were talking about before. Other post-operative complications, they really are those that are arising mainly in the post-operative period. And probably one of the most significant causes of problems is actually serious exudation, vasospasm, and obviously visual loss is probably our most worrying. Now, apex lesions do carry a significantly higher risk of complete visual loss of, after surgery, particularly if they're below the optic nerve. Uh, but this patient, for example, and this is sort of patient that makes you get worried in the clinic, when you see very little and they see very little, okay, so his vision is way down, and you end up with these peanut lesions jammed in the apex. They are at significant risk of visual loss, but they're going to lose their vision if you leave them. But the million dollar question is, should one irradiate some of them? But the risk is there because of all the vessels. But what are the possible mechanisms for this visual loss in orbital surgery? Could it be direct optic nerve laceration? Well, if you think about it, in practice, this is almost impossible to achieve. Optic nerves are surprisingly tough. And you'd hardly end up lacerating the optic nerve without being, noticing it, unless you're using some sort of electri electro-cutting uh, thing like a, uh, like a sort of cutting loop, uh, mono monopolar cutting loop, where you may go through it without noticing. And... In general, you don't have any clinical signs that there's been any optic nerve laceration in the patients in whom I have had visual loss. Is it that one is transecting the ophthalmic artery and causing optic nerve ischemia? Well, 
Yes, it is at risk, particularly in apex dissections. So the ophthalmic artery is at risk, but to actually go through it is surprisingly hard and you'd certainly know about it because of the scale of hemorrhage that you would get. And interestingly, of the patients in whom I've had visual loss, the, you really don't end up with clinical signs that you've occluded the artery, which would be there at the end of surgery. We always check the fundus after apex surgery. So is it damage to the apical arteries? And well, compression, particularly if you already have a compromised vessel, is obviously frequent during decompression. And yet we don't, as I say, with uh, medial wall decompression for thyroid eye disease. I've never seen a visual loss due to it. Uh, but apical branches of the ophthalmic artery are at major risk from intraconal dissections. As we showed, the artery goes from lateral, typically goes over the nerve in most cases, and then plunges down medially to go into the, uh, to become the medial branches and supply the anterior optic nerve. And so these various areas, lateral in the apex, above the nerve in the apex, and particularly below the nerve in the apex, these arteries are at risk of tractional or thermal injuries and indirect inflammatory injury in that wherever you operate, you will cause an inflammatory response. And we know that inflammatory mediators cause problems with arteries, as I'll talk a little bit more about later. And in general, the occurrence of visual loss in those apical arteries due to spasm of the apical arteries may not be evident within the eye apart from ischemia. And my overall conclusion is that visual loss with orbital surgery is mainly due to post-operative vasospasm. Let's show an example here, for example, a perfectly straightforward mid-orbital cavernous hemangioma. And uh, here is the patient the day after surgery. There was no fundus signs at the end of surgery. Here they are on the day after surgery with three millimeters thickness, ultrasonic thickness, and edema throughout the fundus. They've got static stasis within the arteries and so on. Now, here we are doing fluorescein angiography. Okay, now this is 28 seconds after injection. And you can see all that is showing is the choroidal perfusion, a few islands of choroidal, but a lot of choroidal ischemia. So this is total uh, retinal artery ischemia. And at 28 seconds, you should, of course, have gone through the whole angiogram and out the other side. So already it's not filling the retinal. At 100 seconds after, they're just starting to fill the retinal arterioles. In other words, we haven't cut through the vessel. It's purely in terrible spasm. And here we are at 400 seconds. Still, there is some within the uh, within the arterioles and even the choroid is not fully perfused so fascinating degree of spasm long term here is the patient a few months down the line with some optic atrophy and a lot of retinal pigment epithelial fallout and sub retinal scarring and intra uh, scarring of the vessels remember how it used to be but here is the central retinal artery blood flow perfectly normal on this side. So it was purely spasm. The artery was never sectioned. So how does this vasospasm arise? As mentioned, you've got your central retinal artery coming in, supply the anterior optic nerve and the sort of uh, side branches and the peel supplied to the posterior optic nerve. Well, normal vascular perfusion coming in one end, same amount of blood out the far end, oxygen uh, coming out through the vessel. Could it be to reduce perfusion during the anesthesia? So, you know, systemic hypotension, a dehydrated patient, you know, an overenthusiastic drop in blood pressure. And I think this can be contributory. Low perfusion in, low perfusion out, low oxygen transfer. Or is it due to reduced perfusion due to intraoperative bleed? In other words, you have a significant bleed, not from the ophthalmic artery, but from a branch of it or so which takes off most of the supply until it's dealt with, this hemorrhage. So you get this drop in perfusion combined with the already low blood pressure and degree of dehydration, which causes ischemic damage. So it may be a steel syndrome due to loss elsewhere. 
third sort of cause is, is it external to compression of the artery during surgery, you know, pressure of retractors and so on, giving a reduced perfusion? Well, interesting, do we, none of the cases in whom I had uh, visual loss had post-operative bleeding. And in most cases, we were removing the mass. In other words, we're actually creating space. So if anything, we should be improving the space available. So it's unlikely to be a mass after surgery. And really, the evidence is strongly suggestive. We know it's vasospasm in almost all cases. There's probably trauma causing it. If you strike an artery, uh, you'll get a vasospastic response. It'll gradually get a degree of severe vasospasm, which can literally close the vessel down for a prolonged period. And the clinical evidence really for this is that you really don't see this type of visual loss with extraconal surgery. You really only see it with intraconal surgery around the apex, uh, where you are liable to be actually touching the vessels. And it's commoner where you've got a difficult dissection, so at the apex or an abnormally large mass. The blindness is commoner where you've already got optic nerve compromise, in other words, perfusion may already be down. And there are no cases in my series where there was total occlusion of the retinal artery. You still had some perfusion even afterwards. And there's, as I say, the clinical signs suggest progression after surgery. So I've had several cases who may be 636 after surgery with signs of early ischemia who will then progress down in vision and visual function over 24, 48 hours. Now, probably the most important cause of vasospasm, apart from direct injury, you know, uh, manipulation of the artery itself, either direct touching it or distorting it, are inflammatory mediators. We know that thrombin is a very potent arterial spasmogen. And we know that from the neurosurgeons that the most significant risk of permanent damage following subarachnoid hemorrhage is due to the free blood in the CNF, CSF. It causes vasospasm. And that's why neurosurgeons regularly will use nimodipine. And the biggest cause of morbidity after subarachnoid is due to the vasospasm. Uh, and so their efforts are to reduce vasospasm. And of course, the central retinal artery is a central nervous system derived vessel. So probably most important is reduce the amount of inflammatory mediators by making certain that you have a drain in place. How can we reduce visual loss? Well, recognize obviously normal orbital structures so you don't take out anything. Avoid handling the optic nerve. I prefer not to see the optic nerve. I prefer it to remain covered in fat and out of the way and regularly relieve tissue pressure because tissue pressure is distorting the vessels and so on and may cause vasospasm. As mentioned, use bilipolar diathermy in short pulses. Avoid long pulses because you get heat transfer during the, uh, the uh, time you, that you've got your energy going in. Don't use absorbable hemostats. There's some suggestion that if you put things like oxycell or other dissolvable sponges in the orbital apex, they may actually expand with time and worsen the problem. I always place a drain where we have orbital apex surgery or where there's liable and there's small risk of continued vascular leakage, even with mid orbital lesions. So where I remove vascular lesions, apart from cavernous hemangioma, things like varices and lymphangioma, I will put a drain in place and then give high dose systemic steroids, both at the time of surgery. And I've considered calcium channel blockers. The trouble is the risk of visual loss is so low but it's hard to know whether calcium channel blockers, which you have to start before surgery and continue for a while after surgery, will really make a difference. Moving on, hemorrhage and rising pressure. If you know, has one has an orbital hemorrhage, then obviously one needs to keep a very close watch on things. I have always said pad all orbits at the end of surgery. The reason for it is that the padding will stop venous and capillary bleeding. And so you, we're using padding and a vacuum drain. You'll actually have a very non-tense orbit uh, if you keep it padded. If you take the pad off after an orbital procedure, 
it will be a nice relaxed, it won't be a tense orbit. Whereas if you don't pad them, they tend to collect a lot of fluid and you already have a tight orbit. If you then have an orbital hemorrhage uh, due to a vessel that's been cut and gone into spasm, you'll get severe and increasing pain. And one patient in whom I had a big orbital hemorrhage and the patient said, oh, that's terribly painful, doc, and took the pad off and it was rock solid. Uh, it was following a canthal sling, believe it or not. And uh, so I let everything out and his vision came back nicely, but there was no question they get severe, severe pain. So any patient who has severe or, or increasing pain following surgery, you must take a look uh, and check the vision. And if you find a tense orbit with increasing signs of visual failure, then try intermittent pressure on it because sometimes that will get rid of uh, edema and allow perfusion of the orbit and the, the actual bleed may stop or it may already have stopped. But if the signs are still increasing, open all the incisions obviously and spread into the tissues with a blunt pair of scissors, spread them open. And if you still have a problem, try canthotomy and canthalysis uh, prior to urgent, uh, uh, urgent exploration. Obviously, how do you do your canthalysis for the uh, fellows and so on? Lots, put some local anesthetic in the skin, do a horizontal incision to split the two heads and then follow up around the margin, arcus marginalis, completely chop through the tissues uh, below the orbicularis and it should allow it all to prolapse out. Infection, don't have to add much on infection. It can occur following surgery. This was uh, referred following an orbital floor implant. This is an early uh, cellulitis and uh, necrotizing infection. This is actually isn't following surgery, but it can occur following any incision. Adhesions, fibrosis, and inclusion cysts. So here's a patient sent along following an effort to remove a dermolipoma. They've damaged the, the capsule around the lateral rectus and taken out rather too much conjunctiva or too much of the lesion, causing a marked adhesion. Here, the patient again had their lateral rectus, tenons, sheath uh, damaged, which and so has got an adhesion syndrome to the lateral rim with restriction of adduction. This patient we saw yesterday referred up with the exposed implant uh, of the floor, and it's due to the approach of using the low, lower lid swinging flap, as we mentioned, not a good approach. And of course, we learned from the lesson two days ago, we should have approached through the upper skin and kept in front of the septum to approach the orbital floor. So you can avoid that by not going through fat. Another group of patients that I've got a lot of interest in and uh, sort of described a few years ago, basically this is a youngster who'd had an orbital floor repair following a blowout and persistent diplopia. So here he is 18 months after surgery, marked restriction of up gaze, some restriction of down gaze. And you can see they've done a very nice implant, probably unnecessary to put in titanium, which they've clearly put in, but they put it in the right place. It looks very nice. But it isn't quite so nice. If you come forward a bit, you'll then see that on the normal side, we have fat between the inferior rectus and the orbital floor. Whereas on this side, there is no fat between the muscle and the implant. And so he has a fat adhesion syndrome. So here he is before. And the way to deal with these, and I have quite a series, which I'm just writing up at the moment. The way to deal with them is basically you free the adhesion from the floor and then you mobilize intraconal fat around so as it bring it down under the muscle all the way along the length of the muscle. And here he is five months later with a marked improvement in his range of motility and marked improvement. And at 16 months, he is back to normal BSV with only very, very slight restriction on the left side and you can see an even better range of movements. Not perfect, but much better. So one should never leave a muscle on a fracture repair, whether you've put an implant in or not. As if you leave a bare muscle on the floor, it will adhere. So always make certain fat is underneath it. Other operative complications that have, may become evident postoperatively affect on the sinuses or CNS with cerebrospinal fluid leakage. So here, for example, following the accentuation and a rather odd repair, a uh, patient referred with a blowhole. Here in the classic old excision style, 
left to heal by secondary intention, they've developed a wet blowhole coming out through the socket and into the sinuses. And here a patient who'd had a direct approach was sent up with a discharging fistula, which went through to a fracture and there was an implant within that was trying to get out. Here, another patient referred with a persistently mucky and watery eye, as you can see, following a repair of an orbital floor fracture. And when you look closely, they put in a titanium implant, uh, which not only goes into the lacrimal sac area, you can see the sac on the other side in the upper duct, the upper duct, so they put it actually into the lacrimal sac on that side, but also it goes into the sinuses, here on the axial, you see the titanium has gone right through the sac and is canaliculate and so on. So it's best to avoid putting it in. That's one complication. And when we explored the area, there's some mucus around. We're about to do a DCR and remove the implant. And we're taking out the implant because you don't want that three electrical system. And so unnecessarily large implant for what was going on. Most of them don't need metal work like that and certainly don't put it through the sac. Another implant, another problem which I caused, and I had a series of these patients who ran into this problem. Back in the early 90s, I was doing a huge number of three wall decompressions, uh, bilateral, or in this case, unilateral. And uh, I was maybe doing three bilaterals a week for a few years. And uh, so we get really good results by doing through a lower lid swinging flap, end up with three waller. And there, the patient really symmetrical. Look, he has an esotropia because he has an amblyopic eye on that side, uh, plus the medial decompression, but a very nice result and very symmetric. But here he is about 18 months after surgery, and he'd noticed that he's getting a deeper and deeper sulcus, and the eye is setting in a setting sun. You know, he originally he should be up around here with his pupil, and it's dropping down. And what had happened was I had because I took out the whole strut, as I mentioned before, nowadays I do not take out the whole of the inframedial strut. So here is the inframedial strut on the right side, and on the left side I've taken it all out, thinking it will get a bigger decompression. Well, it certainly did. It gave a very nice decompression to start with. But later on, you've occluded antral aeration, and so you get a glue antrum, and it starts imploding. You can see the anterior wall is imploding inwards, the medial wall is imploding towards the sinus and his posterior wall was also imploding. So it's a secondary imploding antrum syndrome due to my surgical damage, allowing the fat to prolapse and block antral aeration. Dissemination of tumor cells. This is important. So as I mentioned the couple of days ago, the Basically, in the old days where we did on-block resection of the orbit for adenoid cystic carcinoma of the lacrimal gland, we ended up with a, quite a number of patients who end up with intraosseous recurrences really marked within the calvarium, in the bone, and then spread into the brain. And these are ghastly. The patient would die over about two or three years till they finally died from pulmonary metastasis or from brain invasion. You can see the edema. And so now I don't, I do, I do not do any on-block resections. I never move bone if I can. And I've not seen this now for over 25 years. And the second thing is in relation to lactal gland tumors, the key thing is remove pleomorphic adenomas should be excised intact as you'll basically cure the patient. They should not be biopsied or removed piecemeal. So any well-defined mass that looks like it could be a pleomorphic adenoma, take it out intact. Because basically, if you disrupt them, they really have two main problems. One is malignant transformation. We know that the risk of malignant transformation is about 30% by 20 years after disruption of a pleo. So they have a significant risk of malignant transformation and the second problem is they can get benign recurrences. And they're typically lots and lots of little peas that occur throughout the orbit, scattered throughout the orbital fat. And this girl had about 13 years, okay, presented about 13 years after she'd had a sort of uh, disrupted pleomorphic adenoma. And it was throughout her orbit. Just to show you an example here, for example, a patient sent to me about six years after 
and they'd resect the pleomorphic adenoma. And you can see these lots of little peas. They're almost like lentils or dried peas throughout the orbit. And here an enlarged lacrimal mass, which is uh, again recurring in the area of the original lacrimal gland. And on the coronal image, you can see them scattered here, there. That's probably the frontal nerve, but that's probably another one. And they occur throughout the orbit and they're really hard to deal with. However, I took out the whole of this area and all of the mass there and the periosteum and all the peas that I could find. And four years later, he has been stable and he's got a ptosis, unsurprisingly, because I had to take out so many, much of his upper part of his orbit with no evidence of recurrent lesion within his orbit. And so looking quite good, but not quite that good. If you see there, he has a little hole appearing in his uh, in his calvarium. Now, this is benign lesion. All of the ones I took out were benign. And so I said, OK, we'll give you a small ptosis correction because he wanted to get married and improve the photos. And so I said, I'll do a small ptosis correction. But whilst I'm there, I will explore out over the rim. So if you remember yesterday, I mentioned you can reach right outside the rim into the temporalis fossa through an upper lid skin crease incision. And you can see it's within the crease area, but you can come right outside into temporalis. And there is the hole in the bone. We've removed the mass from within it. I then treat the hole with absolute alcohol to kill any micro cells within it. And he's done extremely well. Where did it get in the bone? Well, the answer was they moved bone for a bone swinging lateral orbitotomy. And it was the tumor cells were put in the tract there. And you can see the original nylon suture they used to close the orbitotomy site. So avoid opening if you've got a tumor, particularly a malignant one, but also a benign tumor like pleomorphic adenoma, avoid dissemination of cells. It's very easy to do. And finally, sort of orbital and globe ischemia, just some examples really due to ischemia here, ischemic change in the temporalis and the bone of the lateral rim has led it to collapse somewhat. Here in a post-irradiation accentuation socket, complete breakdown of the lateral wall due to ischemia, and this is mummified bone, which could be taken away and it all healed up eventually. And again, breakdown of flaps due to previous radiotherapy. So briefly in summary, complications with the orbital surgery are those that are interoperative, where you may damage structures on the way in, uh, you know, structures unrelated to the lesion, or collateral damage to tissues whilst you're removing the mass, particularly thermal injury, compression injury, and loss of blood supply. And remember, the post-operative, the, probably the commonest cause of blindness is vasospasm, which is fired off by handling of the vessels, so minimize handling, uh, particularly in the apex, and try and avoid seeing the optic nerve and inflammatory mediators to make certain that you drain the apex or where you've uh, dealt with vascular lesions, apart from cavernous hemangiomas, which really don't bleed, and then the other causes. Thank you very much. If you do that, you might have a relatively relaxing time. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Professor, for such a lucid uh, talk and a very detailed uh, presentation of the complications. Uh, with your kind permission, can we uh, proceed with the questions for this session? Of course. Yeah, please do. Sure. Uh, when we notice an intraoperative pupillary dilatation, uh, what are the uh, next steps to be taken intraoperatively? Yeah. Excellent question, Subhav. The causes of dilatation of the pupil are sort of several fold. The commonest cause by far is persistent pressure, uh, and which is causing a transient ischemia of the pupil, not actually a neural problem. It's just literally the pupil. And if you take the pressure off the globe, I mean, the answer is always take the pressure off and see what happens. Uh, if you take the pressure off that sort of pupil size, which often will have reached about five or six millimeter diameter from maybe three beforehand, if you take the pressure off, that often recovers within a couple of minutes and it'll come back down to its normal size. The other is where you get a more persistent, either a sectoral 
and you'll get an asymmetrical, you know, a keyhole pupil. And that generally is a sign that you're affecting one of the sort of long ciliaries uh, around the back. And if you're dissecting in the intraconal space alongside the nerve, then that is at risk. And again, take the pressure off and hope it recovers. Uh, larger pupils in general are neurological. In other words, you really are starting to impair the neurology. But of course, a big pupil doesn't equate with visual loss. Some people that think, oh, it's visual loss. But it is an important sign, as you so rightly point out, that you're getting close to critical perfusion in the retrobulbar space. So you're quite right. The answer is take off the pressure, wait and see what happens. Sometimes the pupil will come down, uh, sometimes it won't, and you just have to carry on. The other thing, of course, is if people have used adrenaline at all, uh, put it around the orbit, then, of course, the adrenaline may have caused the pupillary dilatation, uh, and that can mislead you. But in most cases, the commonest cause by far is just this relatively transient ischemia of the iris itself, the pupillary rough, the sphincter of the pupil. And that normally reverses very rapidly within about two minutes, three minutes of taking the pressure off. So, you know, great question. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, the next in line is uh, when we notice an active bleed within the orbit intraoperatively, what are the possible ways to arrest the bleed? Yeah, <laughs> this is always, uh, I mean, if it's really pouring out, you know, you're going, ah, and all one can really do, the first thing to do is to not have your assistants take the retractors out. Everybody goes, ah, and jumps back, you know, as the blood comes out. The answer is don't, because you lose the point from which you've actually got the bleed coming. So tell them to keep hold still, don't move. And I would generally put in a cotton swab but use the tip of the sucker to move it down to the bottom, the area there, and just keep gentle pressure on it for a while. The sucker will take out most of the fluid, but because it's going through the gauze, it acts like a little grid to stop you sucking in the tissue into. So it helps keep the area dry. And most, you know, if you've hit an artery, it will almost certainly slow down fairly quickly. It's all a bit scary to start with. But as I say, the most important thing is the system not come out Put in the gauze with a sucker. Don't go too crazy. The And just give it a, a wee while because, A, the spasm will tend to reduce it. B, obviously, it may well coagulate. Uh, and then carefully withdraw the swab and take a look at what's going on. And you may see the bleeding point. If you don't, then I will literally give it a, a time and then you can use, obviously, a tranexamic acid uh, soaked swab, which is worthwhile just using pure tranexamic acid. Uh, you can scatter it in it, or a solution, and put it down the bottom there and just wait a few minutes, again, to help any coagulum that's formed to be more stable. Uh, but otherwise, it's always a nuisance. More problem, in a way, is... The, the worry is that if you've got arterial spasm has stopped the bleeding, then it may start up afterwards. But so a, a good drain alongside where you're operating is important. If it's venous bleed, you're doing a venolymphatic anomaly, they can in a funny way be more annoying because they're not easy to coagulate the veins. As you know, they're rather soft, like wet toilet paper, and you end up diatoming one bit and it bleeds from somewhere else. But uh, you can only sort of deal with it. The most important thing is don't panic. Don't withdraw the retractors or you lose the point deep in the orbit from which the bleeding has come. And once you lose it and the blood's just coming up, it's really hard to refind it. So don't panic. Rule number one. And get your, your anaesthetist. Pay them more. And then they might drop the blood pressure a wee bit for you, which, of course, they can do transiently by increasing propofol if you're using it. Uh, or an inhalational agent if they're using it, you know, depending on what they're using. You can drop the blood pressure transiently. But, of course, that might increase your risk of visual loss due to the steel syndrome that I mentioned. Do you remember? If you're having blood pouring out somewhere else, you may reduce the perfusion of the artery even further. So I'm in two minds, but it does make it easier to find the vessel. 
uh, is there a role of intravenous tranexamic acid and intravenous uh, steroid like a dexamethasone when you notice a pupillary dilatation or an intraoperative orbital bleed? Yeah, the a really good question. The first thing is I always give a posterior orbital, a mid-orbit and a posterior orbital exploration, a high-dose steroid during surgery. Uh, make certain if you're doing things like biopsying what you think may be granulomatous polyangiitis or something like that. Make certain you've got all the blood tests beforehand because, you know, a few doses of steroids and things like PR3 and ANCA will revert to negative rather quickly. Uh, or ACE, if it's purely orbital sarcoid, will revert very quickly. So make certain you've got all the bloods. But I always give steroids for mid and posterior orbital exploration. Um, the, and I continue them afterwards. I uh, tend to give most orbitotomies 10 days of steroids, you know, something like 60, 60, 40, 40, 20, 20, 10, 10, 5, 5. You know, so 10 days of prednisolone. Uh, it reduces the acute injury response. After all, we're damaging patients. May reduce egress of vessels and leakage of inflammatory debris. Um, the tranxine, when I was a kid, it just wasn't available. It's really become much more available recently. And so uh, some of my colleagues are using it all the time. I haven't tended to, but I have no nothing against it. Uh, it seems to work very effectively for lacrimal surgery and so on. So I bow to those who've done more, who would know more about it, but certainly have used it in some cases. Uh, point well taken, Prof. Um, the next uh, question is, uh, whenever we encounter a transient ocular motility defect on postoperative day one. Uh, what is that we explain to the patient postoperatively? And uh, how long do we wait for it to recover? Yeah, that's uh, the best thing. The thing I love to hear is the patient saying, oh, crumbs, you know, I've got double vision. You know, it means they've still got vision in the eye that you want. You know, so you go, hallelujah, first thing. Okay, and that cheers them all up. The uh, So... As I say, the, I, I actually like diplopia in a funny way because it's reassuring for the patient. The second thing is the, uh, in, I don't get too worried because, you know, you, we've been stretching muscles, we've been pushing them aside and so on. So I just explained to the patient that, you know, provided if, they're, if they can actually actively move in the field of the muscle, you clearly haven't completely denervated it. It's clearly if they're grossly deviated and can't do even a flicker of, uh, you know, significant. But if they can reach the midline, for example, if they're adducted after you've done lateral expiration and they can come to the midline, that tells you that they almost certainly have enough uh, lateral rectus function that they'll recover. So I explain it. Look, if you broke, twisted your ankle yesterday severely, you know, I've danced inside your orbit is what I'll tell them. You know, if you've broken your ankle or twisted it yesterday, you wouldn't be working. You wouldn't expect your ankle to work properly and be able to move and walk. It's exactly the same with orbits. And most of them you'll find, especially with this steroid, are much better when you see them a week later. Yes. Um, uh, Professor, there's a question pertaining to the excentration of the orbit. Uh, in a post excentration case, how often do we aspirate uh, the socket. Right. The almost all excenterations now I will do with skin muscle sparing. Um, I wrote a significant series up in OPRS, so it's worth checking it out because uh, they do so well. I mean, really well. The key thing there is to make certain that the patient does not blow their nose for about two weeks after the accentuation, they can sniff, wipe and pick to keep their nose clean. But, and they can expect a bit of you know, blood down their nose, but it explains to them if they blow, they may blow air behind the socket. Uh, if you get them to do that, when you put the pad on, I leave it on for a, a week, uh, you will find that the, they're really unbelievable how well they do. Uh, it will have already hollowed out, so you can get the, pros the uh, prosthesis fitted on the glasses very, very quickly within two or three weeks. And they can wash normally. They can be out and about. As I say, the only restriction is do not 
uh, do, do not blow your nose. Occasionally, they will form a blowhole because the ethmoids, the lamina papyracea, has developed, you know, it's become ischemic, and they'll get a blowhole through their ethmoids, even though you've, they've not blown their nose or anything. And what will happen is the socket, instead of being nice and hollow, it's like the hollow in the palm. That's how I describe it to the patient. That's how deep it'll be when it heals. Uh, it'll start coming forwards, and it'll be trampoline. You'll be able to actually feel that you can bounce on it. But otherwise, you don't need to uh, aspirate the uh, cavity because it'll completely reabsorb and turn into a nice block of collagen. Uh, so in general, I don't aspirate at all. You really don't need to. If they get a blowhole behind, if it's a one-way valve blowhole, that's a nuisance. If they can blow air into the socket and it doesn't go back out, it's a nuisance. And if... Uh, if they get that, just to get your ENT surgeon to do a partial ethmoidectomy, so it just becomes wide open and it won't then get a valve effect and it'll still have air behind the surface, but it won't be troublesome. Uh, if I heard you correctly, Professor, you said you leave the pad and bandage on for a week. Correct. Yep, absolutely right. Yep, there's no reason to take it off. Because provided, I mean, you don't want it incredibly hard, but the elastoplast and a couple of, I fold one iPad and put it under and then put a, a complete iPad on top. So it's not really hard, hard. You know, it's just sort of pleasantly indentable. Uh, so it's firm, but not hard. And I've never had one break down, interestingly, we're using that technique. As I say, the paper's quite illustrative, so it's worth having a look. OPRS. It was about two years ago, I think. Uh, and uh, on the concept of a steroid washout prior to performing a biopsy, uh, what is your current take on it? Oh, yeah, brilliant question. Yeah, the the tr the problem of the patient who has been on steroids with a, probably uh, some form of inflammatory or a lymphomatous lesion, uh, the answer is... If they're on the steroids because they had visual impairment, in other words, their vision had gone down, I tail down as far as I reasonably can, uh, and that the you know without without losing vision, so that I'll hold my nerve if they drop, get slightly worse at six twenty four. But if they start develop, oh, sorry, six eighteen, if they start developing an RAPD or a marked decrease in color vision then I'll, I'll get scared off and I'll do the biopsy even if they're still on some steroid. But make your pathologist realize they're on steroids. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I try and wash them out for at least a couple of weeks, uh, at least a couple of weeks, because we know that it will still have an effect on the cell population, but it may be getting more representative with time. But that really, you know, Sabav, you're bringing out the very point that you really got to try and get the best possible tissue before starting steroids. Steroids, you know, an empirical trial of steroids is probably not justified in most orbital disease. But that's another story for another lecture, another day. We'll be happy to see you that day as well. No problem. We'll do our best to entertain. Uh, Professor, the last question for today is uh, one of the cases which you showed on the presentation where a lesion, a well-circumscribed one, was stuck at the orbital apex. And uh, you said that probably biopsying it is an imminent threat to a loss of vision. So uh, what do we consider radiation of the orbit in such cases? Uh, I think, yeah, that was the case with the really massive, massive schwannoma along the roof. Unfortunately, he was referred sort of 18 months after you know, people had sat and watched it. And it was just so big. And I avoided a lot of pressure. So I'm not quite certain. I think it just must have been literally the retraction around the uh, around the superior orbital fissure. Uh, and irradiation, I mean, you can expect some reduction in size, but it doesn't get rid of the problem. That's the trouble. And who knows how much it will affect the optic nerve perfusion, because the dosage required to treat a benign lesion like a neurilemoma is quite high. And so the honest answer is I don't know on that one. We know that small 
presumed cavernous hemangiomas, pea-sized ones, jammed in the orbital apex, appear to lose about a third of volume following radiotherapy, which of course nowadays can be more accurate with stereotaxis, can be more accurate than it used to be. Uh, but you're not getting rid of the problem, and it may just be that we're deferring, which may be all you need. You know, if you can defer it for 10 years, the optic neuropathy, that may be all a patient needs if they're 65 or 75 or 85, God willing. But uh, the honest answer, I think, Sabab, is there's no absolute answer to that one. You just have to warn a patient with an apex lesion. And I really spell it out to them. and I write it in the notes. You know, you've got... I, I'll deliberately scare them. I'll say, you, you look, your vision's way down. If you leave it, it'll almost certainly disappear, which is true. We know that. The the If you have something done about it, you may get a 20 to 30% chance of losing the vision, which means a 70 or 80% chance that it gets better. And I've seen some spectacular recoveries from removing P-like lesions in the orbital apex. Genuinely, I've seen count fingers and a totally you know, impossible field where they can't see anything and not even the or control, because of course it's count fingers. I've seen that recover to six, nine with an almost complete field. So you can get some really good results, but the patient just needs to know they are taking a bet. If you leave it, they're likely to worsen. I do talk about radiotherapy, but most patients would say, Let's go and, and take the chance. Um, but unfortunately, there are one or two patients in whom I've had, and again, you look up the paper in OPRS uh, on visual loss with lesions. We found that the risk is significantly higher for apex lesions and for fibrous cavernous hemangiomas. They come in two sorts. They're the ones that are much softer and spongy with huge vascular spaces. And there are other ones that have a lot more in the way of firm mesenchyme and less in the way of vascularity. And those ones tend to incorporate nerves in themselves, actually running through the wall, and also have a higher risk of visual loss. But it's all there in the paper. You know my motto, read the paper. <laughs> uh, thank uh, you so much, Professor, for uh, uh, patiently answering all our questions. No, and it's a pleasure, thanks. Thank you ever so much, it's, it's been fun. Yeah. And we would love to have you again for another, I mean, many such more lectures. I wish we could. Yeah, you're welcome to ask. I'll, I'll send you the shopping list and we will, uh, you know, because it was fun updating these talks and so on. So thanks ever so much for the invitation and, you know, all the best with the series. And thanks to Mr. Zadio Tech. He's done a grand job. We didn't fall out this time. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Take Thank care. You so all much. the best. Thanks. Bye now. Thank you so much. Bye. Morning.